This episode is about the paint job pickup for two RV14s. One of them had an emergency, and spoiler alert, it wasn't the red one. Okay, so the inspections are complete, and the guys are about to go test fly after making sure all the control surfaces are attached correctly. I expect this will be uneventful, but it was major maintenance, so that's why we're test flying. And I was incorrect. We got problem. Oh no. About halfway through the test flight, oil temperatures started climbing and it hit 252 out of nowhere. Like the oil cooler has to be blocked by something. So yeah, this one was real. Uh, you know what it could also be? Scout tubing. It's not connected? Came off. Look at it, it's blown off. Oh, yeah. That'll do it and create that absolute runaway condition that I knew was happening. We'll debrief this event with incredibly rich engine data while debunking some myths about troubleshooting. So this is great. Here is 90 seconds of both emergencies from when they start to 90 seconds out. You're using up all of the luck for the three of us, Steve. Yeah, well, I'm sharing the love so we can learn from it. A future episode will be all about the paint job mission. But for this one, we've got some great data from Dave's emergency to analyze, and we're gonna address two main points. Can redlining oil temperature be validated by cross-referencing oil pressure and cylinder head temperatures? And how and when should a pan-pan call or emergency declaration be made in this context? In the previous episode, my oil temp redlined during recovery from a loop. And it's been very interesting to compare my data to what happened to Dave. It turned out to be just instrumentation, but there was some great discussion about how I handled it, and that's what inspired this episode. And speaking of previous episodes, Glenn is here for this one. Congrats, man. How you doing? Thanks. His RV-14 has been right alongside the flight shop's plane the whole time, so it was fitting that both of us were picking up our airplanes at the paint shop together. Beautiful. Yeah, this is really nice. This is perfect. This yeah, is absolutely perfect. I'm I usually can find problems. I am not seeing them. Yeah, great job, man. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. I know you guys pushed hard to make this happen, so. We did. Yeah. The whole team. Is this the wingtip that was smashed? Because you guys made it disappear. I think. I can't remember. Yeah, that's perfect. An entire episode is coming about flying the airplane down for the paint job, but here's a 15 second sample. So we're missing a little bit of a, a corner piece there. <laughs> it's got a little bit of a chip on the back. Yeah. Nothing we've never seen. So it's salvageable? Salvageable. Okay. We'll fix it, then we'll let somebody walk around the back of it at Oshkosh and do it again. And do that again. <laughs> Catch it with their pants pocket. Yeah. It should be faster, right? It should be a little faster. Normally three knots in cruise, three to four knots is pretty normal. Sorry. Once we fare out all the gaps in the fairings and all that, you know, every little right. quarter knot on every piece adds up a little bit. So on top of the obvious changes that new paint will make, there's a whole bunch of other things that we need to check. What's happening, test pilot? We had all the control surfaces completely removed from the airplane. With all those changes, you want to make sure that everything's been put back on the airplane uh, correctly. So we're doing a thorough walk-around inspection, checking all the bolts that hold all the control surfaces on, making sure there's torque seal where the torque seal needs to be and where there's cotter pins where the cotter pins should be. And I'm going to go up and do a full standard, um, just as if it was coming out of an annual inspection test card. So we know this didn't go as planned, so I've assembled the team of pilot nerds to debrief in great detail. And we have a lot of crazy good data here because we have an example of an actual runaway oil condition where the scat tube disconnected from the airplane. And I have to clarify, this was 100% on me, not the paint shop. Well, at least we figured it out it's something simple. It's simple. That was probably the most unnerved I was, I've ever been. Most of my concern wasn't landing. It was like, I don't want to pop this engine. The fear was entirely of breaking the airplane and not getting back on the ground safely. So the oil temperature did exceed the maximum permissible red line by quite a bit. That's not data that you normally collect because nobody's willing to, to go out and test yeah, that. Yeah, that, that's awesome that you guys got that because it's like, <laughs> yeah, who's going to go up and be like, okay, we're going to shoot for 260 today. So yeah, that's Thaddeus and Dave. And I'm not kidding. Those are the pilot nerds. We've actually decided to launch a channel for deep dives into technical aviation stuff. And there's actually an extended version of this analysis over there now. 75% power. We are showing a true airspeed of 175. I'm going to come do another pass the other way. We'll see what that gives me. It's interesting because there's kind of two things that cropped up looking at that emergency footage is that um, there's a, uh, I guess we can call it a myth that you're going to 
see some kind of oil temperature to pressure correlation, which is sounds pretty plausible. Oil gets thinner, pressure comes down. Right? I've definitely been told this. Yeah, sure. Right. And the other one is, I think, a little more fringe is that you're going to see a strong correlation between oil temperature runaway and your cylinder head temperatures. And, and that one, I think, is a little more far-fetched for me personally. Okay, let's go straight and level for a minute. Now we're looking at a true airspeed of 170 at probably a DA of, I'm just estimating, around 4,000 feet. I had to estimate because I wasn't on the panel. So this thing's going to hustle at altitude. All right, let's set it up. So cow flap, mixture ridge. We're going to do some approaches to stall. We're not really comfortable with the height for a full stall, but we're just going to make sure the wing's going to hold out uh, and fly, you know, true down to near stall speed in a clean configuration, then in a dirty configuration. Then we'll do the flap tests. Uh, when that's complete, I'm going to switch tanks, do a couple circuits, call it a day. And then not a couple weeks later, Steve goes out and proves that you can you can cause the same anomaly in a totally different way, which is a very um, Steve thing to do. So anyway, I got my screen shared up here. I got some pretty cool charts to talk about. This is data from both flights, mostly my uh, actual runaway condition. Like I'll call it, it's, they're both emergencies in my opinion. I do not want to call the other flight a fake emergency because it's not a fake emergency until you're on the ground and determine, oh, it was instrumentation. Both emergencies, one was an actual runaway, one was a false indication. So this is um, my flights oil temperature versus pressure okay this is the start the the far left of the chart is when the the scat tube popped off i was running at a continuous 210 i had just come out of slow flight um, and stabilized handling and then i was into a high speed pass the oil was at 210 and this is not a, a, a representation of time although this took place over about 35 seconds this is a representation of for every degree the oil temperature increased what was the pressure reading uh, and in the very very important part is what was the engine speed and it, it was it was constant because i was in a high speed pass i was configured for 2600 rpm and you know what was the oil pressure because it's very dependent on both um, mostly engine speed and then secondarily oil temperature as, you, as you're going to see. So at 210 we're at 78 psi and then five degrees above the maximum on the far right of the chart we're at 76 psi. That is a two psi delta. We didn't even drop from 78 to 77 until 228 and then hitting the maximum was only one pound out from 210. Are you going to use that data to determine if you have an actual high temperature condition? I would say absolutely not. You've triggered the maximum at 235 at 77 PSI and you're down to 76. And you might say, well, I really know my engine. I always run at 78. Well, here's a chart showing that same flight, okay? Engine RPM versus oil pressure in some slow speed handling. So I had a nice consistent, um, I haven't labeled the chart here yet, but it's 211 degrees. So very close to the same temperature. And this is various engine speeds while I'm approaching the stall. Look at this wacky trend. It, I've got lows at 55 PSI and highs at almost 80 across 1290 to 2490 or so at RPM. So the RPM is the major, major, major influencer on that pump because the pump is running at the speed the engine is running at and the oil is going to move through it um, based on that speed. So this makes perfect sense. Look at those low data points like every... <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't there. even consistent. Are you right? shifting? Uh, like. <laughs> right. Those low data points, I think, are mostly in spool up. But the important thing is kind of interpolating a point that goes across that. It is very driven by engine RPM. So you're, you're, you're just going to tell me like, oh, well, I've got the engine RPM. So yeah, I, I, you can't say that you know within a pound on a given RPM. Like you'd, you'd need to be so intimately close to your engine. Well, that's that's got to be really close to the threshold of tolerance, the, the error margin for the sensors even. Yeah, that's probably within the error margin of the sensor. And let's let's take uh, this with a with the fact that we've got a G3X, which is showing us one digit increments. Yeah, and imagine me flying the Archer around. Right, what is what is one <laughs> tick of movement? Needle that's thing? like, oh, it's, it's in the green. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah, that's square, the square instrument there. <laughs> and just to be clear, the, the concept of oil pressure and temperature is the one failure mode where you lost your oil like it drained out. That's the one everyone thinks of, right? It's like, okay, I guess that's a case where it's going to get hot and the pressure is going to drop. That's a fair, that is a very fair case. It's going to be a dramatic oil pressure drop though. Back on board with Dave, the slow speed portion of the flight is complete and he's about to do the high speed parts of the test. And it's going to get exciting. 
It's raining. Oh no. Oh, it's so clean and now it's raining. Well, I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do about that except try to move away from it. And I guess before Dave's emergency, it's worth reviewing mine. The previous episode covered that in great detail if you missed it. Part of my plan here was to do some aerobatics and test out the four flight Sentry Plus and do some track log comparisons. That obviously didn't happen, but anyway, we are giving one away this month along with a bunch of other cool stuff, including some RAM mounts. An important debrief point for both my emergency and Dave's is that due to the configuration we had set up, we did not get a visible cast message on the screen or an audible alert. So that's something that we have fixed since these flights. And right back we started, that was actually pretty good. So sick. I didn't look at the G meter, but I got to four, so. Epic. The oil just went to 250. Oh shit. Dave caught it a lot faster than I did. Now granted, I was eyes outside doing the loop and he was in highly engaged test pilot mode. Let's go, there's 80% power. So I'm gonna let Dave's emergency play uncut. This is the Cloud Ahoy debrief of his flight. Love using this for all my debriefing purposes, so shout out to Cloud Ahoy. It's two and a half minutes from the point he notices the problem to getting it on the ground. What the f*** is my oil so hot for? Flap is open. That is just getting hotter. Okay, we gotta land now. I was over the airport, the whole envelope of that test flight was over the airport, and I'm gonna close the throttle. I'm gonna land right now. It's open. Thankfully, I just had a really easy decision tree in that. You, you had a much harder one, uh, honestly. Gadsden, Foxtrot, Charlie Golf Alpha is landing 2-4 immediate. Because I got accused by a couple people of trying to save the engine. The decision tree for what I had to deal with, save the engine or save ourselves, was pretty similar. It's identical. It's rich. Work the problem. Boost pump. There's nothing to do with it. Cow flap is pulled open. It is 250 degrees. Obviously, in my scenario, I was I firmly believed it was a runaway oil temperature, and it was. Uh, you can accuse me all you want, I was saving the engine. Yeah, if the engine did blow up on me, I didn't know if I was gonna be facing a fire. I'm trying to keep it cold, but it's not getting colder. And if I had a catastrophic failure, now I'm putting it in a field with these super duper low profile wheel pants, which probably mean we're flipping over. Caution, terrain ahead. I know exactly where you were doing the acro because I go to the same spot. Uh, first of all, you, you did not have an airport within gliding range. You got lots of fields, but again, yeah, you're right. That airplane is not suited to land in an unmanicured field. You, you had an operating parameter outside of the limits of the operational manual. 500. You're now a test pilot. The engine will maybe keep running forever. Or maybe it will stop in the next five minutes. Full flap. 80 over the fence looks good. 24. Wow. Guys, then Foxtrot Charlie Golf Alpha Final 2-4, full stop. You went back to your home airport, which you know, and I know. It was totally fine until just then. But not everybody watching knows is full of fields between that location that you were at and getting back to Windsor. And, and ironically, saving yourself relied heavily on you saving the engine. <laughs> yeah. So that's, I reject that point. Is the oil 240 degrees? Next point is even more, I think, obvious, is that this cylinder head temperature idea, that there's gonna be a correlation there, is, in my opinion, fairly ridiculous. So here is a 90 second uh, sample from when my scat tube disconnected, and then 90 seconds from there. And here's the oil temperature starting at 210 and reaching a high of 243. These cylinder head temperatures are all completely and totally normal. Um, 339 to 346. Most of this change was from accelerating uh, after the slow flight into a hotter condition for the cylinder heads. This is pretty easy to explain, right? The engine is a 300 pound mass of aluminum. The cylinder heads are making tremendous amounts of heat in combustion. 
the idea that the six quarts of oil, which weighs, anybody remember what's, the, what's, what's a quart of oil weigh? Man, I, I can't recall off the top of my head. No. Oh. No. Pilot no. nerds are failing no miserably on that one. Not, not very much. A small percentage of that engine's thermal mass is oil. All right, it weighs 28 ounces. To see a connection here, the idea that you would see some kind of correlation in CHTs to oil temperature in this kind of a scenario, like there's no way you would cross-reference this data. Well, I love having this because it's logical to think that and the, the people that were commenting that it was fair, but here's the data to say, no, that's not something you can possibly use to diagnose. I've, I've absolutely been told that, you know, I've absolutely been told that when having that thought experiment, what do you, what do you do, like, how do you know if it's an instrumentation problem? Well, it's interesting you raised that point because we have this data here for the two <laughs> Together, because we've managed to produce an instrumentation problem and an actual problem on the same airplane inside of the same time span. <laughs> You're like a microcosm of aviation just rapidly traveling through time faster than the rest of us. It's almost like we rigged it. I think it's completely rigged. I think this Flight Shops channel is totally bogus. It's awesome that we got this. I think this is great. So you see kind of an anomaly here in, in a slight variation of pressure at the big, or temperature. This is all temperature in, in Fahrenheit on both oil uh, for both flights. And you got kind of a representation of the operating red line um, across the, the graph here. So Steve's got a dip followed by an insane impossible increase, right, during this G-load. And he's not looking here. This is the worst scenario. He's, he's not looking. He never saw 280 because he's in the middle of a loop. Like it's, it's your eyes are outside. It's the worst time. And I've got this very kind of slow linear increase where things are slowly, mo very stably running away. The problem is if you, as the operator of the aircraft, notice it at this in intersection, say that's when you glance, is at this intersection. Well, from that trend point on, our emergencies look very similar. Like they're very stabilized, high, above red line oil temperatures. So the handling of this as an emergency was absolutely appropriate. And especially, especially primed with the information that this just happened weeks prior. Yeah. Oh yeah, I was certain it was a scat tube again. Absolutely. I would have been absolutely certain and, and I would have been absolutely flabbergasted at the fact that it wasn't later. Right, yeah. There you go, like the data supports all of this. The biggest thing that relates to CHTs is, is the richness of the mixture and the engine power. So again, like you have to leave everything in this insane steady state configuration and let it just fly ballistically in this red zone and watch the CHTs and go, oh man, I think there's a trend changing, which could take, well, you'd never, you're never gonna see it. Well, yeah. We have the da data to show. We have 90 seconds of the data because neither of us were in a position where we felt like just running this scenario. We need to go for another circle. Right. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, this is a mayday, mayday, mayday. Actually, let me make it pan and pan because this is good data. When you have an instrument that is red, uh, going through some thought exercise that you're going to pull out some analytical kung fu in that moment and be like, I'm going to start. You know, you just watch the gif of like the math symbols moving by, like <laughs> while you're in the emergency, like that yeah, no. is not appropriate. That is not good aviation decision making. It's not good airmanship. And yes, the appropriate reaction is to divert to the nearest airport uh, urgently. And if you need to declare the emergency. Yeah, I've, I've never, I've always wondered like, like has, it, has anyone ever made an emergency call and been like, dang, I wish I would have called Pan Pan. <laughs> <laughs> So regarding neither Dave nor I declaring an emergency or making a pan pan call, I figured nobody was more qualified than Jason Miller to answer that question. And this content is going to be made into an interactive scenario for the Ground School app, which I'm proud to be a part of. Hey Steve, thanks for letting us take this video and make it a scenario in the Ground School app. There's so much to learn here. Uh, but regarding whether or not you made the pan pan call, I think there's a lot to consider there. Now, I don't want to freak anybody out or say you shouldn't declare an urgent situation with pan pan or you shouldn't declare an emergency with a mayday. Um, all of that is on the table and it's great. But in the practical world, you have to keep in mind that had you said those words, air traffic control would have had a hundred questions for you. It's possible that in the situation you were in, having made that call would have been more of a distraction than anything else. Um, so they're gonna ask you things like, who said that? Say again, what's the nature of your emergency? How many souls on board? They're gonna get you answering questions for them. So 
if you could perceive that you could make it to the to the runway just fine without doing that I would say avoid it. Now, again, that's not to say anybody should be hesitant to say it if it's required. Like if you're number four, right? And there's four people in front of you, you're gonna say, hey, wait a minute, Pam Pan, I've got like an urgent situation here. So um, anyway, just something to think about um, whenever you contemplate declaring an emergency or declaring an urgent situation. So I thought you did the right thing. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that one. And I got to shout out Garmin for the rich engine and flight parameter data that we pulled off the G3X. I've got lots of awesome IFR content coming flying behind this panel, including GTN training at Garmin headquarters. And until next time, keep your flight chops sharp. Evelyn has taken over this PC, which is why my headset is purple and pink and my keyboard is a rainbow. Yeah, so I thought I would just uh, start this discussion with a quick song about oil temperature emergencies. <laughs> this goes like, uh, oil pressure. No. Oh. Yeah, you got to wail on the electric guitar for oil pressure emergency. That's right. That's right. You do. No one ever stoked it into like acoustic guitar. No.